the story of the Bible, cities have their origin in human fear and violence. It's Cain who built the first city as a means of preserving his own life instead of trusting God who promised to protect him. One of Cain's descendants, Nimrod, is the man who builds the second city in the Bible, famously known as Babylon. Nimrod is depicted as a guy who might be part human, part spiritual being, a bad guy of cosmic proportions. Sometimes the bad guys in Marvel movies are just like somebody who got hurt and they're good with electronics. And then sometimes the bad guys are these cosmic demigods. Gilgamesh is like that, and Nimrod's like that. And the fact that Nimrod and the city of Babylon are full of language, all linking back to the Nephilim and Lamech and Cain, providing and presuming to take God's name and protection and make it for themselves. It's all of that stuff with the volume turned up to 11. Babylon becomes one city that represents the height of both human and spiritual rebellion. The people of Babylon are unified, but they're unified around making their own name great. Humans who define good and bad by their own wisdom is parallel here to Babylon accomplishing that unity, but in a way that centers all humanity around one language, one culture that claims for itself that what Babylon does is what God wants for the world. God wants unity for the people of the world, but not unity that resembles homogeneity and not unity that comes at the expense of other people. Not everything that Babylon aspired to was bad. It was just the way that they would go about it was going to be for the benefit of a few at the expense of the many. And God says, and shutting that project down. Today, Tim Mackey and I discuss the origins of the great city, Babylon. I'm John Collins, and you're listening to Bible Project Podcast. Thanks for joining us. Here we go. Hey, Tim. Hey, John. Hi. Hi. We got really kind of philosophical <laughs> in our last episode, talking about the city. The nature of human society. Yeah. And how, we, how we're just going to end ourselves. <laughs> and so wouldn't it be just better just to end it all? Mm. Mm. It's just not the natural kind of way to think about mm. human life. It's very dark. <laughs> Kind of existentialism of just like, mm. oh, this yeah. is worthless. Yeah. Let's and, just end it. And what you're describing is we spent all of last episode thinking about the narrative sequence in Genesis chapters four to eight, where the story of Cain and Abel, Cain's murder, and Cain's violence scales up with his descendant, Lamech. And he Cain builds a city, and then Lamech, whose name is King backwards, start scaling that violence, but also good things scale in his city and in his day, like animal husbandry mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> and art and creative arts and music and metallurgy and so on, but also violence scales. And then with the story of the sons of God and the origins of the Nephilim and the violent warriors, it's just like God's like game over. Yeah. You see the potential is what you're saying. The potential mm-hmm. is there of like, how wonderful it is yeah. for us to scale in a beautiful way. But instead of the potential realizing, it's the the evil takes over. It's, it seems like the tendency of humans toward violence and self-ruin overpowers anything good yeah. that we tend to do. And the portrait of the city and the spiraling of violence through the line of Cain leading to the flood is a key part of that. Can I put it this way? Mm-hmm. We're talking about the predictability mm. of the city or... Yeah. I don't know if it's a better word, but the the inevitability oh, yeah. of the city yeah. is what it feels like. When God says, man, I just know yeah. that human everything in the human heart yes. is evil from youth. At the conclusion of the flood story, yeah. God's reflection is, man, humans are going to, this is just what they do. We're jumping around. I'm so sorry. Yeah. <laughs> like things get so bad, God says, humanity is going to destroy itself. Mm-hmm. I'm going to take this down. Mm-hmm. Like, let's just shut it down. Yeah. Well, or, so, you know, what's so great is I feel like I'm being you right now. Yeah, okay. Like, you started with this line of thought, and I'm trying to think, of the, audi- think of the audience and try yeah. to explain it and bring them along. Oh, good. So, the story of the flood begins with God saying, the end of all humans has come up before me. They're mm-hmm. going to destroy themselves, so I'll accelerate it. But he chooses one. Yeah. Which means God's not done with humans. Right. He's just going to let this generation cycle itself out and start a new one, just like the generation in the wilderness. Yeah. 
later in the Torah. Then when Noah surrenders everything, God looks and he says, well, you know, humans are going to keep doing this. This is just what humans do. The inevitability, the inevitability. of human civilization. Yes. Of hu humans scaling the efforts, multiplying and subduing the earth, yep. it's going to result in horrific yeah. settings yeah. and situations. The city's going to be bad. Yeah. But if there is one among the human family, a righteous intercessor who, like Noah, will surrender what's most valuable and precious then God says, I'll work with all of humanity because of the one. And then that's where we... Somehow I'll carve out and I'll mm -hmm. find the good. Mm -hmm. The good will overcome. Somehow. Somehow. So, and the story doesn't say how, you just have to keep reading. And things are going to continue to get a lot more depressing before we ever see the bright ray of sunrise. If this is the first time you've listened to any of these conversations, you might be jumping in and really confused. We're, <laughs> we're in like, what, the fourth? Yeah conversation in a theme of the city. The city, yep. And so we just tried to summarize in a very haphazard way, <laughs> Genesis 1 through 8 yeah, yeah. of human civilization mm -hmm. undoing itself yeah. and God rebooting it with Noah. Yep. And at the center of that mm -hmm. is the setting of the city, mm -hmm. which is introduced as the symptom of a problem, yep. which is humans can't trust God and each other, and we've got to try to protect ourselves. Yep. So cities in the Bible are defined by an enclosure of dwellings surrounded by a wall, protective wall, to yeah. protect you from animals and humans that want to kill you and take your stuff. Okay. So we've followed that cycle through yeah. of the story. What's going to happen is now, just like Adam and Eve had three sons and Cain had three sons that led to the whole thing we just went through, now the new human... Noah and his wife, who's we're never told her name, they have three sons as well. And the story of those three sons is also going to lead to the building of another city that it's all going to replay all over again. So what we're following now is from the story from Noah to Babylon, hmm. with the biggest, baddest city like ever. <laughs> so far. In the story of the Bible. And it becomes the, like the narrative beginning mm -hmm. of the biggest, baddest city in the story of the Bible. Totally. That, of all. that lasts all the way to the final pages of the Christian Bible in the Revelation. So Noah and his wife have three sons, Shem, Cham, and Yafet. That's how you say them in Hebrew. And then when they're introduced, this is Genesis 9 verse 18, Ham is singled out and you're just told, oh yeah, Ham is the dad of a guy named Canaan. Just tuck that away, reader, Okay, because you'll need that. Because we'll know a lot about Canaan later. Yep. And from these three sons of Noah, all the land was scattered. And, mm, and that's where this story's going. Yeah. It's, it's already like pointing forward to the scattering of Babylon. Yeah. So Noah began to be a man of the ground. And he planted a vineyard. And you're like, oh, like, a, like an Adam. Hmm. Gardener. Yeah. Now, our, remember the word ground is the word Adama. Adama, so it rhymes with Adam. And then also he's planting uh, a little garden, which is what God did hmm. in Genesis chapter 2. And he drank of the vine. So he, he consumed the fruit of his garden. No, that, I mean, I, yeah. That's great. great. Yeah, actually God said, enjoy all the yeah. food. Every fruit. tree, every... Yeah, totally. And uh, a vine is a tree. Yes, that's right. Yeah, innates. Exactly, innates. Yep. Yeah. So he drank of the wine of a vine, and he became drunk, and he uncovered himself in the middle of his tent. So he consumes the fruit of his garden, and it leads to nakedness. So instead of consuming the fruit of the garden leading to life, mm -hmm. which was the point of Eden, yeah. somehow this led to something else. Yeah, and this is all very cryptic and riddle-like. And it's assuming that you're going to compare these two, this is four lines mm. in the story that is recounting in parallelism the whole, what took a whole chapter in Genesis 3. Genesis 2 and 3. But the planting of a garden, mm. the enjoyment of the food, but something foolish related to that food that leads to nakedness. It's a very condensed version of that narrative pattern. Of Adam and Eve's story, yep. So then we're told that Ham 
And then all of a sudden again, remember, he's the dad of Canaan. Super, super important. <laughs> Just keep that in <laughs> mind. He looked upon the nakedness of his father. That's the phrase. Yep, that's the, the nakedness. Phrase. Looking on so, the nakedness of his father. We, I think we'll just say we have a whole episode where we really dive deep into this scene. Where this landed for me was when there's the law in one of the yes. books of the Torah. Leviticus chapters 18 and 20. This was a very specific phrase to talk about. Um, yep. Sexual intercourse. With your father's wife. Mm -hmm. The nakedness of a father is a Hebrew idiom for a man's wife. Okay. Mm -hmm. And specifically why a son should not have sex with the nakedness of his father. That is, with his father's wife. Yeah. And that is what the phrase means here. Okay. Oh, and in Leviticus 18, doing that is called the custom of the land of Canaan. Oh, well, and here's Ham. And here's Ham. The, the father fa of Canaan. Yes. And what you're saying, if we just jump to the case, mm -hmm. there's this rivalry happening, yeah. not between brothers, but between son and dad. Who gets to be in charge here? Ham's the youngest son, and Ham takes advantage of his father's vulnerability by pulling an alpha male move, a move to become the family patriarch. Yeah. If you want to go into that more, we talk about that in the Firstborn yep. series. Yeah. So that's going to be relevant for a future conversation we have about the Sodom and Gomorrah story. Okay. But this illicit crossing of proper boundary lines is a motif related to the city as it goes forward. So what happens is Noah wakes up and he announces blessings and curses on different sons. The one thing we didn't address is the... The nakedness of the father is, an, is a metaphor. Yeah. But then, as the narrative continues, like, it's literally he's naked and they're covering him. Mm -hmm. so yeah. It's a continued metaphor. Like, yeah. I think that it's most likely an, an intended double meaning. Okay. So. I see. Because they cover. Because he's drunk. Mm -hmm. So, like, there's something shameful about being passed out drunk in your tent. Mm -hmm. But then there's also something shameful about mm -hmm. Ham wanting to take advantage of his father in that state. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So the two brothers, Shem and Japheth, they get a blanket and they cover their dad, yeah. presumably mom, who's mm -hmm. there, and don't look. You know, it's so funny is we ended the last episode of like, man, but we, if you just have one blameless guy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you could reboot humanity. Yeah, yeah. And the first story is like he's drunk in his tent and his kids yeah. are taking advantage yeah. of the situation. Yeah. Or one I of mean, the kids. really, Ham's the bad guy here. Ham's the bad guy. But Noah's just a fool. He's a fool. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Noah makes it. And that's kind of like Adam and Eve. Mm. They're more depicted as foolish. Fools. Yeah. Making a poor decision. As, Ham, Ham's the snake here. He's the snaky guy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And notice that it's about him seeing, which the woman saw that the tree was good. And then she ate. She gave to her husband. He but that ate. was a foolish seeing and a foolish yeah. taking. And then they saw they were naked. Uh, now here's a guy who's like this. And that all happened in Eden Yeah. because of the deception of a snake. Now here's a guy who's acting snake-like. And he's the one who sees the nakedness. Yeah. So again, we're taking the vocabulary of the Eden story, but we're, it's always a twist. Yeah. Yeah. So Noah wakes up and he pronounces a series of blessings and curses. And what he says is, cursed be Canaan. <laughs> and you're like, well, Ham's the one who did the thing. Yeah. Well, remember. But this is all written from a perspective. Much later perspective. Much later perspective. Mm -hmm. Where we know that one of the biggest conflicts is going to be between Israel and this people group called the Canaanites. Yeah. Also, we were told multiple times Ham was the father of Canaan. Uh -huh. So, yeah, to cursed be Canaan is both in Israel's historical experience, the Canaanites were kind of their arch rivals. Right. But this wasn't even written land. during that time. This was written then well beyond that, reflecting yeah. on that. And then Canaan is no longer, there's no longer like the Canaanites that Israel has to deal with. Israel's in like exile from a Babylon. Right. Yeah. So like that's the thing to deal with. Yeah. So just just wait for it. Okay. Yeah, just wait for it. <laughs> so well, all we're told is that the lineage through Ham, this guy named Canaan, who I think likely is the implied offspring of this union hmm. between Ham oh, and okay. his dad's wife. It doesn't say that, but I think the narrative design implies it. That lineage will become a servant to his brothers. Blessed be Yahweh, the Elohim of Shem. There's going to be a lineage through Shem, mm -hmm. that, and Yahweh is going to be associated with that. That's where Abraham comes from. Okay. And let Canaan be his servant. 
may Elohim enlarge Yafet and let him dwell in the tents of Shem and let Canaan be his servant. Okay. So three sons, Shem and Yafet are associated. Things could go great for them mm -hmm. if they learn how to dwell in one tent in unity. And they will rule Canaan. And Canaan will be underneath both of them. And Canaan is this literary like character that yeah. represents the seed of the snake. Yeah. Okay. So just let's move forward. <laughs> and what we're going to find in the story is uh, another genealogy with a couple narratives. Genesis chapter 10, sometimes called the Table of Nations. And it begins by saying, these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, Japheth, who were born, and there were born to them sons after the flood. And then it's a list of all these different descendants from these three sons. So we get a list of the sons of Japheth. There's 14 listed, two sets of seven. It's interesting. Then at the end are the sons of Shem, and in the middle are the sons of Ham. Hmm. And it's out of birth order. Okay. But when you get to Ham, I want to just, here's how the list for Ham goes. Okay. Which is right in the middle. Right in the middle. These are the sons of Ham. Ham had four sons, Cush and Mitzrayim and Put and Canaan or Canaan. So four sons. Okay. Okay. The genealogy is going to go follow three of those sons, Cush, and then Mitzrayim, and then Canaan. Put, who knows? He just... Put. He invented golf. <laughs> 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 he headed to Scotland. <laughs> so you get uh, the list of sons from Cush. There's eight of them. And then in verse Genesis 10, verses 8 through 12, is all, a little narrative crammed into the genealogy. Yeah. It's, it sticks out. Because in verse 13, it's just a list of sons from Mitzrayim, and then verse 15, a list of sons from Cain. So this narrative is interesting. And it's about how Cush had one more son. Cush became the father of Nimrod. Hmm, Nimrod. Are, is this all like the next generation of sons, or is this like son after son after son? So Cush were Seba and Havilah mm. and mm. Sapta. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are these like all Cush's like, they're the brothers? Or is this like... Sons. So the sons of Cush were, and then it lists five sons. And they're brothers. They're all brothers. Okay. Yep. And then it singles out one brother, Ra'ama, and then it talks about his two sons. Okay. And then all of a sudden, you're, uh, okay. you're given one more son of Cush. Okay. So you were told five, but now here's number six. Okay. And we, d we don't know. The narrative just really wants to focus us on certain things. Yes. So the father of Nimrod. So Nimrod in Hebrew means we will rebel. Whoa. <laughs> it's also the Semitic name of a city, Nimrud, that was way out in the Mesopotamian plains. Hmm. Let's keep reading. Okay. He began to become a mighty warrior in the land. Ah. Oh. And, well, you're saying, ah. Oh. <laughs> This is the same word used to describe the Nephilim. Okay, they were described the as mighty warriors. Yep. Okay. Nephilim were mighty warriors, men of the name. That's how they're described in Genesis 6. And they were created from this, you know, the offspring of yeah. the sons of Elohim. Yeah. Or they're associated. Just associated. That in the land at that same time when that oh. stuff went down. Isn't it just interesting? At okay. the same time that the uh. sons of Elohim but did But here, their thing. clearly, this is a... Uh, this is a son of Cush, who is a son of... Yeah, son of Cush. Uh, as a son of... Yeah. Sorry, Ham, which is son of Noah. Mm -hmm. so these aren't sons of Elohim. Well, just wait for it. Wait for, wait for it. it. Okay. So, he was a mighty warrior before Yahweh. Like, hmm. and I think before Yahweh doesn't mean like he had a relationship On behalf with Yahweh. of Yahweh? Like... Yahweh saw him? It, yeah, Yahweh saw him, or before can actually mean quite a lot of things. It can even mean... If you were to compare or in the presence of Yahweh, 
this guy's a big deal. Okay. Yeah. He's a mighty warrior. You actually. could contrast him to Yahweh in, in, yeah. a, in a sense. Yeah. Well, Yahweh's powerful. Yeah. He's actually called a Gibor in the poem that oh, Yahweh is? Yeah. Yahweh's called a mighty warrior. Oh, yeah. yeah. In the sure. poem about his overthrow of Pharaoh. Okay. So, you know, Yahweh's a mighty warrior, and uh, Nimrod, he's, here's a, he's, yeah, he's a mighty warrior, too. Okay. And he's a hunter, an animal slayer. Hmm. Therefore, people say, like Nimrod, a mighty warrior hunter before Yahweh. Hmm. People love, he's a man of the name. People love to celebrate his name. <laughs> like, you know, maybe if you're like an archer, and you win, you win <laughs> like the contest in your city, and people will say, like, you're like Nimrod. Right. Yeah. We do like to celebrate our athletic heroes. Mm. Ah, so our athletic heroes in the modern West are modernized versions of what in medieval Europe and in Rome were the gladiators. Yeah. Just minus the death. Yeah. Kind or of. like it, or like <laughs> if you like the jousting. Like Yeah, yeah, that's right. The contests. Yeah. yeah. These were just like who yeah. can who can take who out? Yep. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. But in this era, in the cultures of the arena, right? Mm -hmm. Your battle prowess on the battlefield or yeah. in the arena is how you gain a great name for yourself. Yeah. And that's this guy. He's a mighty warrior hunter. So it's all very elusive, <laughs> but we're describing somebody who's a pretty violent dude mm -hmm. and people love to celebrate his name. And then we're told just a short few details, the beginning of his kingdom, you know, a kingdom. Mm, yeah, this has gotten quite large. This is the first kingdom we've come Oh, this come is the across. first kingdom, okay, yeah. Yes, and what we're going to start hearing about is all the cities, plural, that make uh, up his kingdom. But the beginning, the chief of his kingdom was Babylon. Yeah, and Erek, and Akkad, and Kalna, all these in the land of Shinar. Hmm. And Shinar and Babylon are actual... They're Hebrew words, but they're based on Semitic roots that go back to the Semitic language on the way other side of the Eastern Desert, which is called Akkadian. Oh. Yeah. Bab il means the gate of the gods. Oh, really? Portal between the humans and the gods, Babylon. Yep. Okay. Just like Eden. So he built one kingdom, Babylon, mm -hmm. Erek, Akkad, Kalna. So there's one network. And then from that land, he went forth into Assyria, and he built Nineveh, and Rehovot Ir, and Kala, ooh, and also Rezin between Nineveh and Kala. That is the great city. Rezin is the great city? It's either Rezin. Or Nineveh. Or it could be that all of this together is a network of oh. cities that's just called the great city. Isn't Nineveh called the great city in the book of... Jonah? Yeah, yeah. The phrase, this is the great city, is used twice in the Hebrew Bible. <laughs> oh, yeah? <laughs> right here. Uh huh. And then go call out against Nineveh. The great city. That great city. Yeah. That's what God says to Jonah. So, in what sense did one guy I know. start all of these <laughs> city, states, and empires? Totally. Yeah, totally. So, here's what's great is that Nimrod is a version of a name of an actual region out in ancient Mesopotamia. Okay. And pinning down to what Mesopotamian king this Found actually it at was. All. Yeah. To, I mean, this is like, this is one of the Holy Grail hunts of <laughs> uh, Hebrew Bible studies. There's, there's going to be an Indiana Jones yeah. movie on this. Yeah, totally. So there was an Israeli scholar, Yigal Levine, who um, wrote an important kind of research essay on this. And his conclusion, I think, is pretty persuasive. He says, the biblical Nimrod is not a total counterpart of any one historical character. He is a composite Hebrew equivalent of the kings of the Sargon dynasty, that is, in Mesopotamia of the late 2000s, the first mighty king to rule after the flood. So there's a common shared cultural narrative between the biblical story and Babylonian ways of telling their, their history. And, of a great flood. Mm -hmm, yeah, and the pre-flood and great flood and post-flood are uh, cataclysmic flood mm -hmm. in the region is yeah. 
a key marker. Yeah. That's why there's all these Babylonian versions of the flood, Atrahasis and mm -hmm. the tale of Utnapishtim. And, and it, you know, it makes sense in Mesopotamia to have a great flood narrative. Yes. Yeah, because yes. they live in a flood zone. Correct. That's they live right. in like a, yeah. like where it's great, like it's fertile valley. Mm -hmm. We could build a city here. The big problem is mm -hmm. it can flood. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so it kind of makes sense that in their like, mm -hmm. In their history, they've experienced it, and the yep. way that they they process decreation and like these cataclysmic events that could happen is a flood. Yeah, that's right. So that's one piece. Also, the origin of the great kingdoms and networks of kingdoms that made up the Mesopotamian plains, who built them and how they were built. This was the stuff of. Babylonian historical legend and so on. This is like Gilgamesh and... Yes, actually, Gilgamesh is one of them. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we'll get there. Okay. But so the point is, what Yigal is saying is, if you take all those cities that were just named there in yeah. Genesis 10, like they didn't all, they weren't all built at one time and by one person. Right. It's as if Nimrod is like Adam and Eve, mm. right? Representative characters. Uh. Remember, their names mean human and life. Right. And Nimrod's name is... Mighty we, warrior. Oh, we we will, will rebel. <laughs> we will rebel. <laughs> and here's this uh. character who's the origin of these all these Eastern kingdoms and empires that are going to become the biggest bad guys in the biblical story. Mm. And so it's not fiction, because these are actual places. Right. But it is a stylized... History. Um, history that's wrapping all of the origin of these kingdoms into one time and place with a representative royal figure. Yeah. Who's like Cain or like Lemek. And remember Lemek's name is King backwards. Mm -hmm. And this guy builds the first kingdom. Mm -hmm. He's the first king Yeah, of a kingdom. So that's interesting. Okay. What can I say too is yeah. what's clear though is in the same way that Lemek was like representative of the seed of the like mm -hmm. snaky line of Cain. Mm -hmm. Nimrod is this ultimate king yeah. from the snaky line of Ham. Yes, exactly right. So again, the historical legends about these first kings after the flood in the ancient East that built the cities that are named here, one of them in particular is a key figure, Gilgamesh, you brought him up. He was a Sumerian king. And both in the narratives and in the art depicting Gilgamesh, he's depicted as a giant. Mm -hmm. So I'm showing you a picture right now of a early sculpture of Gilgamesh, and he's holding a lion like the way you hold a, a house cat. Right. <laughs> yeah. So he's a mighty warrior hunter, mm. and he's a giant. He's a gibor. Yeah. One of the giant warrior kings. So the point is that Nimrod is within himself the parallel to Cain and to Lamech and to the sons of God and the Nephilim. He's like all of them wrapped into one dude. Yeah. Wow. Gnarly dude. Mm-hmm. That's the point. Got it. So, you know how in Marvel movies with these like cosmic, <laughs> sometimes the bad guys in Marvel movies are just like, you know, somebody who got hurt. Yeah. By their parents when they're growing up and they're good with electronics. And so they can like, <laughs> You're like Dr. Octopus or yeah, something. Yeah, and they can like make a mechanical <laughs> suit or something. And then sometimes like the bad guys are these cosmic demigods, yeah. you know, coming down out of, from another reality. Yeah. So Gilgamesh is like that. <laughs> <laughs> or, and Nimrod's like that. And so that's the kind of cosmic bad. Cosmic bad. Yeah. Now, if you're Babylonian or a Sumerian, you're celebrating these guys. Oh yeah. These aren't cosmic bad. These are your no. These are your heroes. This is a version of the origin of Babylon told by the people group that got smashed by Babylon. <laughs> yeah. 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 First and that's just significant. Totally. Yeah. Significant. What you're saying is let's keep in mind all of these stories, the final yeah. like craftsmanship of these stories were by the people mm -hmm. who were taken out of mm -hmm. their land by Babylon. Correct. Yeah. And oppressed right. by Babylon. Yep. So there are two versions of the building of Babylon in the Hebrew Bible. We just read one of them. Kind of like there's two narratives about creation at the right. beginning of Genesis. There's okay. two narratives about the city of anti-creation. Hmm. So we just read the first one. Yeah. Nimrod did it. Nimrod did it. 
you get another version of it in Genesis 11 and how the two go together. It's a whole rabbit hole that um, we go down in the classroom class. From Noah to chapters. Abraham. From Noah to Abraham, yep. But here's the other version. This is the more well-known story in Genesis chapter 11. All the land was one language and unified words. And it came about as they journeyed east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar. Mm -hmm. Like, oh yeah, yep. That's yep. And, where, Nim and Nimrod made it. Yeah, that's where, <laughs> and they settled there. So Nimrod's nowhere to be found in yeah. this account. It's just all the land had one language. You're like, oh, well, I guess that's how it would have been getting off the boat with the flood. Right. At one point, I don't remember what we were jamming on, but at one point we were looking at this and you pointed out that this kind of meant like one way of thinking too. Like one... Oh, yes. Unified words. Yeah. Exactly. So one language, it's literally the word one lip, mm -hmm. which could be a metaphor for language, but unified words sounds as strange in Hebrew as it does in English because mm. it could mean the same or it could mean unified in the sense of, well, I, I, actually, that's why I chose this translation, unified. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In other words, a shared cultural language. Everyone's talking and thinking and the thinking same. Thinking the same, exactly yeah. right, yep. So they want to, well, they go to a plain of Shinar. So a plain is a low place. Yeah. So they go to a low place, but they want to turn it into a, a high place. Mm. And so they said, each to his neighbor, come, let us brick bricks and burn them as burnt. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and for them, brick was like stone, and tar was for them like mortar. What is that? What's the relevance of that? Oh, well, first of all, they're going to bake bricks. Yep. They're going to brick bricks. They're going to brick bricks by baking them. And they're going to make structures instead of stacking stones. Uh huh. Because you can build something by stacking stones. Okay, so that's more primitive technology, stone mm -hmm. and mortar. Yep. Brick and tar mm -hmm. now is like a little more precise, structurally sound. Yeah, man. You can do a lot more with it. You can mass produce them by baking them, and you can stack them. Yeah. It's efficient. Well, interesting. This... Unified thoughts and language, unified yeah. st structures. Structures that yeah. build. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And it's a, paying attention to the development of technology. Yeah. Just like back in our previous conversation about the streams outside of out of cane city mm -hmm. came this development of technology and metal mm -hmm. and art so here we have a development of technology that's going to lead to a city yeah so they use tar to join the bricks together and you can make structures that are bigger you can make more of them and you can make them faster okay and they said come let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose head is in the skies. And let us make for ourselves a name so that we are not scattered upon the face of all the land. Mm -hmm. Why are they worried about being scattered? Well, they want to be unified. Mm. Uh, they are unified and they want to remain, remain that way. Unified. Yeah. And they want a name. Yes, like Nimrod, mm. a man of the name. People say his name like the warriors. The men of the name. Does this mean a reputation? This means honor? Yep, that's right. And their name is going to be connected to their unified way of thinking and speaking. And it's all centralized or embodied in this city with a tower, the top of which is in the heavens, which is surely significant. And they go to a low place, a plain, but they want to build something for their name that ascends up into the heavens. That's the idea here. Mm. So you might see that and think, oh, humans are getting creative and they can build stuff taller. <laughs> um, so just like Nimrod, there's a whole backstory going on here culturally about the origins of the city, Babylon, and what Babylon claimed for itself. So it's kind of similar. This is another trash talk story. 
that we've talked about some in the past. By that you mean Babylon's a known quantity Mm -hmm. in the context of these stories. Yes. And to say, hey, here's the origin of the story of Babylon, Mm -hmm. but it was made from these people Mm -hmm. wanting to be great and watch what's going to happen. Like you're saying that's like a trash talk. Yeah. Okay. So this whole region where there are the plains of Shinar, it's the flood plains of the Euphrates River Mm -hmm. before it meets with the Tigris, right around the place. And Babylon in the Semitic language that it came from, Akkadian, Bob Il is gate of the gods. Yeah. So the earthly gate of the heavenly gods. I see. The linking so, place. So if you're looking for the place where heaven and earth unite, they're saying we're it. Yeah, Babylon's it. Not Eden. Right. Not Eden. Babylon. Mm. So there were many rulers who invested in the architecture of Babylon for thousands of years, even many centuries before Abraham or any of that. So in particular, the huge structure that Babylon was known for was called Etemenanki, which in Sumerian means the tower of the foundation of heaven and earth. (laughs) (laughs) A little presumptuous. This was a tower in Babylon. Yes. Yeah. It was a huge, what's called ziggurat. That was a type of tower ziggurat. Which is, was a stair step structure. Yeah. But instead of the stairs only being on one side, every side, it's actually the forerunners of the pyramids. And yeah. it's the Mesopotamian parallel to what the Egyptians were doing down in Egypt. Okay. But the stair step pyramids. So I think Etem and Nanki, yeah, its origins are around the, the 14th century. And there's Babylonian legend and mythology all surrounding it. Wait, 14th century BC? 1300s. Yep, that's right. This would have been... Yeah, around... Actually, by now we're around the time of the Israelites in Egypt. Yeah. Mm -hmm, That's right. But in terms of... But the way that this this narrative is telling is before the Israelites existed. Mm -hmm, That's right. So the city existed long before that. Okay. You're saying this one particular tower. But this one particular tower was like the most famous tower Babylon was known for, which comes from that later period. So in one of the most famous Babylonian creation stories called Enuma Elish, Mm -hmm. there's a a whole part of the tale of the founding of this temple structure. And it's really remarkable. You can... You just call it a temple. It's not merely a tower. Well, the temple is a tower. The thing is, it's a high place. Yeah, okay. Because it's the foundation of heaven and earth. Okay. It's where heaven and earth meet. Okay, so it's in the temple, yeah. Mm-hmm. So if you read the account of the founding of the structure in Enuma Elish, it's really remarkable. Because literally the language of Genesis 11 just leaps out mm. at you. Hmm. So I'm just sampling here. This is from the English translation provided in a volume called The Context of Scripture. which is a multi-volume resource of ancient Near Eastern texts in English translation edited by William Hallow and K. Lawson Younger. So you can read the account and the builders talk about making a shrine that will make the name of Babylon famous. Mm. It's talked about how they made it with bricks, innovative in brick construction. It's a high ziggurat. They build it as a dwelling for their gods Mm. so that the gods can dwell on earth Mm. with asphalt and bitumen and mud bricks with the summit like the heavens. Mm, its head is in the sky. It's raised its top as high as a mountain. So the point is, this is all, this is in the air. This is yeah. like the pop music. <laughs> sure, right. <laughs> this is what the kids are all into. <laughs> and so the biblical author comes and he's, what he's trying to say is, yeah, you know, Babylon is inspired by the principalities and powers. Mm. The stuff that went down with Cain and Lamech and the sons of God and Nephilim, it's like that, but on an even grander scale. Mm-hmm. And so much so that its founder is one of these mutant humans, right? The Nephilim. Nephilim. But instead of celebrating him, we call him Rebel, the Rebel, uh-huh. which is a compliment in our culture, I guess. <laughs> but it wasn't back Maverick. Then. And then retelling the founding story is instead of celebrating it, it's actually like part of the problem. So this is the second city built in the story of the Bible. Mm. And in the classroom class, we go through, you can show and the account in Genesis 11 here and the story of Nimrod building Babylon 
is all hyperlink through repeated words. Specifically wanting to create a name. Yeah, the name. Yeah, so remember Cain built his city, and then there's a focus on he calls it by the name of his son. Uh huh. And the fact that Nimrod and the city of Babylon are full of language, all linking back to the Nephilim and Lamech and Cain, the humans providing and presuming to take God's name and protection and make it for themselves. It's all of that stuff, but just with the volume turned up to 11. So Yahweh came down. That's for sure a dig. Oh, uh, they're not quite high enough. <laughs> yes. Yahweh is still up above. Isn't that that's, funny? That's great. It's like, you know, let's make its head up in the skies. At which point you would think it would be like Jack and the Beanstalk. Mm. Like the Beanstalk pops up in the clouds. Uh, and Yahweh's like, what? Hey, what's that? What are you guys doing here? But it's like, no, Yahweh had to go down <laughs> to see the city he and came the down tower from the penthouse. that the sons of Adam had built. And Yahweh said, uh, look at this. One people and one language for all of them, and this is what they have begun to do? Now, nothing will be inaccessible for them, anything that they devise to do. This little sentence right here is, I think I have a chart, yeah. This little sentence, look, they are one people, and now nothing they purpose will be impossible. So come, let us go down and let us make babble of their language there so that each one will not hear the language of his neighbor. So you said babble means gate of the gods. Mm -hmm. And this is how I always understood the word babble, meaning yeah. confusion of languages. Yeah. So the Hebrew verb here is balal, okay. which is a play on the, uh, he it's a play on the Hebrew... Word word Bavel, which means mm -hmm. Babylon. But what's so great is that the wordplay works in English too. Yeah. And it may be that it's the wordplay based on this story. Is where it must be. Babel yeah. and Babylon comes from. Yeah. yeah. Babbling babies. Yep. Yeah. So, okay. I don't understand what's going on here. <laughs> really. <laughs> so what God sees is these humans are about to get cosmic. These humans are about to do something with cosmic implications, mm. and they could pull this off. By pull this off, meaning what? If this is what they've begun to do, this is just the beginning of the human project, man, they could do some really cosmic stuff. That's what God is saying. Like they could like send people to the moon? I don't know, it doesn't say. It leaves it to your imagination. And this isn't just about technology. This is about humans joining heaven and earth, but on, on, their in, own terms. on colonial terms. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So what God says is, come, let us go down so that they can't understand each other. So partially, it's cryptic and riddle-like because you're supposed to know the hyperlink. Okay. When Adam and Eve take and eat from the tree, here's what God says. Behold, the human has become like one of us, mm -hmm. knowing good and bad. And now, so that he doesn't stretch out his hand and take from the tree of life and eat and live forever. And God sent him out of the garden. Yeah. So that, Okay, that, and that's always been confusing too, but I've tried to make sense of that in Genesis 3 of like this severe mercy of saying they could mm -hmm. access eternal life, like this abundant life, but in the state they're in, if they do that, mm -hmm. it's just going to be yeah. an eternal misery and it's going to create too many problems. So I got to exile them away. Mm -hmm. And so he doesn't want them to have access to the tree of life. Yeah. And that's on parallel, you're saying here, mm -hmm. through all this hyperlinking of language, mm -hmm. let us confuse their language 
Because if they, because mm-hmm. look at what they can do. Yeah. We don't want them to, it's not a tree of life. It's a great city that. And a tower that is rejoining heaven on earth, but on like just really distorted terms. Hmm. And joining heaven and earth is the idea of eternal life. Yeah. Yeah. You know, what? I think what we're hmm. back to is this scaling of good and bad. Hmm. The human city is where both good and bad are scaled. I see. But if its foundation is in twisted human desire to redefine good and bad and to rule over the universe, but with our redefined knowledge of good and bad, if this is the beginning of what they've begun to do, oh man, they could do anything and that would not be good in this state. Mm. In other words, the fact that these two speeches are parallel to each other, designed as parallel is saying what God is doing in one is related to what God's doing in the other. And what God's doing in the one is saying, you don't have access to the tree of life so that you can't live forever. Um, He prevents them from living forever in a state of defining good and bad by limited, distorted human wisdom. Because Because it'll scale bad. It'll scale bad and spiral out of control. Yeah. Yeah. It'll break bad. (laughs) <laughs> as they yeah, say. Yeah. And so then in the story of the Tower of Babel, mm-hmm. it's that instead of Tree of Life, it's a unified language. Yeah. So in parallel to the idea of being connected to a source of all life, is this parallel idea of being unified in such a way where yeah. you can accomplish and mm. multiply yeah. rapidly. Yeah. Yeah. Which is not in and of itself bad. Right. Just like it's not of itself bad that humans live forever. Actually, that's a good thing. Right. It's good that humans live forever. And it's and it's good to grow and multiply and subdue the earth rapidly. And be and be unified and innovate. Yeah. In technology. These are goods. Good but things. But it won't but it's gonna break bad. Yeah. And so but God humans, wants to disrupt it. Humans who define good and bad by their own wisdom is parallel here to Babylon accomplishing that unity, but in a way that centers all humanity around one language, one culture, that claims for itself that it is the place where God and humans are one, and that what Babylon does is what God wants for the world. Okay, so you just reminded me where the conversation of the one language came from, and that was the Family of God. Family of God video. It was the idea of one people group saying, we have the perspective and answer and everyone is going to become subordinate to us this city and the way it's arranged is the will of god for every other city and we will establish that link (laughs) and it will could you imagine if a politician really thought that just imagine (laughs) (laughs) that's it this is a remarkable meditation that the birth of an empire Mm. and its divine aspirations to make everyone subordinate to the way they think. Make every other city in its own image is likened to the failure of humans, to the fall of Adam and Eve. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is so remarkable. And as we meditate on the parallel to fall of Adam and Eve, God puts them out of the garden. Mm-hmm. They don't have access to the tree of life. Mm-hmm. What's interesting about Babylon and the scattering is like... Mm-hmm. Now you're just going to have more groups of people mm. who can unify around their thoughts and just create cities. Mini Babylons. Yeah. So yeah. like God just, didn't say like, I'm going to take away your ability to create cities. Like he could have gone that far. Mm-hmm. But instead it's just like, I'm. A, it almost seems like he's slowing it down. It's, yeah. It's a slowdown. And Eden, he kind of shut it down. Wow. Get out of here. Yeah, I see. You can't get back in. Yeah. Interesting. Though he did continue to supply them with life yeah. and the gift of... Be fruitful and multiply. Yeah, it and still happens. So Eden is just slowed down, is what you're saying? I'm just saying what happened, the failure in the garden, there it took away the opportunity for eternal life, but the possibility of ongoing life mm. was a gift of Eden that yeah. continued. Okay. So here, the desire to unify is not taken away. It's just, what do you say? Fractalized. It's <laughs> divided out. Scattered. Scattered. Yeah, scattered. That's the word. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. 
but I, I'm just it's scale. This I'm yeah. enjoying this theme throughout the conversations of scaling of good and bad. Right. And even this portrait here is of a good aspiration to unify, to innovate, to find solutions. Mm -hmm. Great. Let's do brick instead of stone. Yeah. Sweet. Right. Man, things work so much better. But then, oh, let's use that technology. Think of all the shelters we could build. Think of all the things we could do. Yeah. But instead, whoa, we could be the gods. We can make, yes, we can make this heaven on earth. This is the city of God. The we Bob, can create Bob the city Ill, of God. Gate of the gods is mm. what the name of the city means. <laughs> Which, and, and we should say, I guess I would want to say is that this impulse to want to create a city of God. Yeah, that's it's the, not bad. Heaven and earth together yeah. as one. Yeah. United with all of like the life, the cosmic life out there. Mm -hmm. That is a good impulse. It's exact, yeah, thank you. That's right. That's and right. And so why doesn't it, why is it bad here? Mm -hmm. Because they want to make their name great? Because, mm -hmm. or just because they don't know Yahweh, the true Elohim of Elohim? Mm -hmm. Like, well, and, and maybe this like is, if they were to let me say it this way: yeah. if they were to say, "Let's build a tower for Yahweh," mm, yeah. Well, I think in terms of the biblical authors, they would say, "Now we're talking," okay, because that's what Jerusalem will be. Ah, uh, okay. At least for a little while, <laughs> for <laughs> until it turns into Babylon <laughs> in the next generation under Solomon. So what you're saying is, let's create Christian Babylon, no, the Yahweh Babylon. But here, here's the thing: is the portraits, the cycle is going to be every time humans take it upon themselves to do this, yeah. it ends up in Babylon. Okay. But what if they call on the name of Yahweh and do and build the city? Yeah, like David does, and it works great until... For a moment. He sees Bathsheba and desires her and takes her for himself and... So we just need that greater than David. It's exactly right. Okay. It's exactly right. What we need is a city of God not built with human hands. Hmm. That's how Daniel will put it in one sense. And how the author to the Hebrews will put it. But doesn't God want to rule the w world through humans? How does he, yeah. how are you going to create a city without humans building it? I don't know. I think God would have to figure out a way to become one with humans so that it can be built by his spirit. I don't know. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to get there. Okay. All right. But the whole point is when humans do it of their own wisdom by their own definition of good and bad, it usually is a mix. And when it's scaled to the degree of Babylon, the good is really good, yeah. and the bad is really, really bad. And we haven't got a portrait of the good being good. No. This is just the bad mm -hmm. becoming bad. The bad becoming bad, yeah. Breaking Babylon. And so let us remember, even though this is about the origins of Babylon, we are being told this narrative within the final shape of the Hebrew Bible that was passed down, meditated upon, shaped and created by the people who were stomped by Babylon. Yeah. Lives ruined almost, by Babylon. Yes. Many generations, almost obliterated yeah. by Babylon. So that Babylon becomes in the Hebrew Bible. This origin story is setting you up to conceive of Babylon as, as the worst. Um, so this is going to, where this is going to launch us, as far as where we're going here, is on into the biblical story throughout the Torah and the prophets. And... We don't have time to cover every single city that we come across. I want to cover one more cycle of the really bad city after this. Sodom and Gomorrah? Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay. It's another icon city, which is depicted as a newer localized version of Babylon. Okay. Not universal, but local. Uh -huh. And so God brings a local flood, mm. so to speak, uh -huh. upon it, but not of water, but of fire. Mm -hmm. So there's Sodom and Gomorrah. And then counter to the city of Cain, Babylon, Sodom, and Gomorrah, I want to meditate on the origins of Jerusalem in the story of David. That's what, where we'll go. And then it becomes Babylon. Hmm. But that golden age where the Ark of the Covenant was there in Jerusalem, there was a, a small little window of time that fueled the Israelite imagination for what it could look like if the city of God took up residence here among a city of man. And um, that's where the poets of the Psalms and the prophets let their meditations go mm. when they think about the heavenly city becoming one with earth. And that is the dream that fueled Jesus and the apostles in the New Testament. Mm. Uh, but, but for the moment, that okay. is the story of the origin of Babylon. It's a mix of good and bad, but at the 
scale of an empire, the bad is hyper-destructive and did prove to be destructive throughout history. And I think that's why this narrative is the way that it is. There are moments when God comes down and says, this can't continue, and he'll shut down an empire. The scattering of Babylon becomes the, what do you say, kind of like the template for the fall of many cities to come in the story of the Bible, but also forms the opposite of what a city of God could be, which is also a heaven on earth that brings all the languages together. Like at the end of the story of the Bible, the New Jerusalem yeah. is like the reversal of Babylon. Hmm. So not everything that Babylon aspired to was bad. It was just the way that they would go about it was going to be for the benefit of a few at the expense of the many. And God says, and shutting that project down. Okay, well, hey. So this is Dan with the podcast team. And I'm here with some new friends of mine who I just met. Do uh, you guys want to introduce yourself? We can just go around the room. So I'm Julia from Toronto, Canada. And I'm Ben. I'm Jocelyn from Austin, Texas. I'm Michelle from Houston, Texas. Well, that's awesome. Uh, so tell me a little bit about how you guys first heard about Bible Project. We heard about the Bible Project actually from a friend of ours uh, at seminary uh, who recommended it as a supplement to our schooling. For me, it's going to be similar to my mom. I, very, very dear friend and pastor, introduced us to the Read Scripture app and uh, it's been a consistent uh, staple in my life since then. Well, what are you guys, some of your favorite things? What's really valuable to you? The podcasts, I like. I love the videos, but they're kind of like the cream on top of my cake. My chocolate cake are the podcasts. Bible Project provides like a safe place for me. It's like a safe space where I can learn about this creator God and I can understand without the pressure. Like it's just an open space for me to like think, you know? And I feel like I'm not pressured to uh, be on board with one viewpoint or another. That's great. Anybody else? I'll say the word studies. Um, I ended up studying Hebrew in seminary and um, some of those uh, word studies were kind of like, oh, right. And then hearing those themes across all of the Old Testament and then into the New Testament and like, the whole unified whole. I love the podcasts and I feel like, even though I know, I don't know Tim and John, but I feel like over years and years and years of kind of these weekly conversations, it's kind of like having Bible nerd conversations with our friends back home, and, but with these disembodied voices on the podcast. <laughs> um, but I appreciate when they actually do bring people with different points of view in terms of evangelical scholarship. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Jocelyn? Yeah, um, so for me, it's definitely the podcast. Um, so I am teaching myself to animate right now. So the videos obviously are like deep uh, creative inspiration for me. Um, but I think the podcast, the Paradigm series in particular, um, very much saved my faith. And really, dang. Now I'm crying. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. Texas, what can I say? Yeah, we do that. Yeah, it gave me language that I needed really like a whole lot a really, really tough time. Mm -hmm. So I go back to it, I send people back to it. It has given me a way to communicate with people that aren't familiar with Jesus or have been really, really hurt. I feel like I have a way to talk about it that feels like I'm talking about something beautiful. So. That's awesome, thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Um, okay, well here, let's do the last part real quick. If you just wanna say it like, we believe the Bible is a unified story that leads to Jesus. We believe the Bible is a unified story that leads to Jesus. We're a crowdfunded project by people like me. Find free videos, study notes, and podcasts, classes, and more at BibleProject.com. Great. Are you guys happy with that one? I think that's great. I'm sure you'll just edit it together. Just do it.